Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, a next-generation sequencing approach to influenza vaccine development. I'm Lisa Henderson, Editorial Director for Applied Clinical Trials, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Applied Clinical Trials and sponsored by Q-Squared Solutions. Launched in 2015, Q-Squared Solutions is a leading global clinical trials laboratory services organization. It helps biopharmaceutical, medical device, and diagnostics customers improve human health through innovation that transforms science and data into actionable medical insights. Q-Squared Solutions is a quality-driven, responsive partner with strong global experience and deep scientific and medical expertise. The Q-Squared Solutions joint venture was formed by Quintiles and Quest Diagnostics, combining the best of each parent organization's clinical trials laboratory services capabilities. To learn more, you can visit them at www.q2, the number two, labsolutions.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. Um, you can submit questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we are going to answer the Q&As after the uh, presentation. You can enlarge your slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. Please also take advantage of the resources provided by our sponsor located in the green Sorry, green resource widget on the dock at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. So before we start, um, before I introduce the today's speakers, we're going to ask the audience to participate in three brief polling questions. And you can um, click your answers directly on the screen. So you can see the first question is do you utilize next generation sequencing or NGS for influenza studies? And your answers, I mean your choices are yes, no, or you do not perform influenza studies. And then we will give you a little time to answer, uh, select the best answer and click submit to do you utilize next generation sequencing for influenza, influenza studies? Yes, no, or do not perform influenza studies. And then I think we'll go on to the next poll. So our second polling question audience again is, uh, if you chose yes, how is NGS utilized in your study? Is it for vaccine efficacy, surveillance, or it's not applicable because you're not using NGS? So again, you just need to pick the answer that's best for you to, if yes, how is NGS utilized in your study? For vaccine efficacy, surveillance, or you don't use it? And thank you for participating in the second poll. And we're going to now go into the final polling question. Do you utilize Sanger sequencing, yes or no? And again, do you utilize Sanger sequencing, yes or no? So thank you all for participating in our polls. I'm now going to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to be joined today by Wayne Hogarthy and Patrick Herbin. At Q Squared Solu Solutions, Dr. Hogarthy is the Vice President of the Vaccine Unit, where he has had overall business development responsibilities for the past 10 years. He has served multiple capacities in the reference laboratory and in in vitro diagnostics business units of Focus Diagnostics, which is now Q-squared vaccines. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Medical Laboratory Immunology and has several patents and more than 30 peer-reviewed publications on immunoassays for vaccine responses, vector-borne diseases, viral pathogens, and emerging pathogens. At Q Squared Solutions, Dr. Herbin is responsible for the identification and implementation of new genomic capabilities encompassing bioinformatics and wet laboratory methods, as well as the development and validation of genomic assays to support research and clinical programs. 
Dr. Herbin has more than 25 years of experience in molecular genetics, including more than 18 years in positions of increasing responsibility in high-profile genomics-focused organizations. His research interests have focused on the genetic control of gene expression and have spanned diverse fields such as toxicology, developmental, and cancer biology. So thank you both for joining us today. And Wayne, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, we have broken uh, this topic into two parts, and I'm going to take the first part which will really be looking at uh, influenza at a very high level, uh, a brief review of uh, um, the vaccine space, and, um, and a very quick look at what is uh, new in the vaccine world and influenza, and just a slide on efficacy studies. And the purpose of this introduction is just at a high level look at influenza to turn this over to, to Patrick. Um, and where his team has been doing the next generation sequencing for uh, uh, looking at uh, influenza isolates at his laboratory at, uh, uh, in uh, North Carolina. So the, uh, starting off, as we know, influenza is a seasonal disease, and it fluctuates in a very typical manner and has for, for probably centuries, but obviously since it's been monitored for decades. If you look at the, uh, the data here from the CDC um, on the left, is just looking at seasonal influenza-like illness. Now, influenza-like illness means it could be something other than influenza, but typically it's driven by uh, influenza. And the, the peak uh, disease is late winter, or excuse me, uh, late uh, in the year November, December, into the early months of uh, January, February, and waning by the time we get to March and April, at least for the northern hemisphere. But even within that um, narrow, relatively narrow window, there is fluctuation. And as you can see on the far left, uh, in one of the years we had a very early season that it started in, in October, November. Uh, other seasons will peak uh, at different months throughout the year, but the periodicity is pretty pretty uh, consistent. And if we look on the right side of the uh, graph, this is mortality. And this also follows the same seasonality, as you can see from year to year by the uh, dark, uh, the black bars. But mortality also varies from year to year, from uh, very high peaks, as you see in the first two uh, peaks, and then more to a typical peak in the third and fourth peak, and then spiking again in the following year. The, uh, and the seasonality in these changes from year to year uh, are really driven by the influenza virus strains themselves that are circulating. And because of these changes, which we'll just briefly touch on, uh, the vaccines required, at least to date, to uh, protect against flu have uh, sometimes they meet their efficacy and sometimes they do not. It's really the influenza virus itself that's dictating what that efficacy will be. So if we look at the next slide, which is looking at, at efficacy, uh, starting 2004, uh, and again, this is in the Northern Hemisphere, this is CDC data, you'll see that efficacy can vary widely. And the two obvious uh, points that uh, you can see there is the 2004, season and then the 2014 season, where the efficacy of the vaccine was quite low. And the drivers for both of those years are very similar. And the, what occurred both of those seasons is that there were moderate shifts, and we'll talk about shifts versus drift in uh, influenza immunogenicity. The um, H3N2 uh, circulating strains those years were a mismatch for the vaccine strain that was in, uh, in that year's uh, Northern Hemisphere vaccine. So for example, in 2004, the AFUGIAN strain was in the uh, vaccine, but that was not the strain or related strain that circulated. The following year, that strain was replaced by A California, and whereas the H1N1 and the B strains were stayed, stayed the same. There was an increase of efficacy, but not great. If we shift to 2014, 
the strain that was picked for the Northern Hemisphere uh, vaccine that year was A. Texas. And again, the circulating H3N2 strains that year did not match A. Texas. So for the following season, A. Texas was removed from the vaccine, replaced with A. Switzerland, and the H1N1 and B strains are kept the same. And you could see the efficacy return to what is more typical uh, for the seasonal northern hemisphere vaccines. Now, the, and we'll touch with, on this in a moment. The strains that are picked uh, for like the northern hemisphere are picked in February. And it's based on the previous seasons, what we see in Asia, what you see in the southern hemisphere. And I've never been involved with that process, but it is a consensus between experts in the field as to what would be the speculation uh, for the, the following year's targeted strains. Unfortunately, because of the antigenic shifts of H3N2 in those two years, 2004-2014, uh, the strains that were picked the previous February simply didn't match very well. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on the, or at least not significant time on the genetics of influenza. Patrick will be covering that uh, in his part of the presentation. But there are eight genes in, in influenza, and two of them, and they're represented here in segment four and six, represent the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, respectively. Now, there are 18 sero uh, serotypes for uh, hemagglutinin and 11 serotypes for uh, neuraminidase. The, these are the most immunogenic, because uh, they're on the surface of, of the virus, uh, antigens that our, that our bodies see. And the uh, hemagglutin is responsible for entry of the virus into the cell via cyanic acid residues. And the neuraminidase is responsible for release of the virus from cells, again, in combination with the hemagglutin uh, antigen. But our vaccines have been uh, picked based on the HA um, proposed or the thought HA uh, strain that will be uh, coming in the, in the upcoming season. And I'll talk about the, you see in the upper right there, the uh, blue diagram for hemagglutinin. There is a head region and a stalk region. We'll, we'll look at that uh, further in a moment. But the head region is where the most diversity of the hemagglutinin gene on the antigens is seen, and it dictates what the matches are between uh, vaccine and what circulating strains will be seen. So there are two um, biological activities that dictate how effective a vaccine is for influenza, and it's determined by antigenic drift and antigenic shift. So I'll spend just a slide on each one. And antigenic drift, as you can see, there are small genes in the, uh, changes in the gene of the influenza that happen and it continuously happens over time as the virus replicates. And those small changes, if they're only small, may not have a big impact on the ability of the immune system to recognize that virus and neutralize it. But as those changes accumulate, the, match, the mismatch between what our, our immune system recognizes and what is in the circulating strain changes and the efficacy of our previous uh, exposure to, to influenza will, will de uh, diminish. Uh, the cartoon in the bottom left really depicts as you get small changes in, uh, in influenza as it do goes through its normal uh, uh, stage of infection between multiple species, not only humans, but porcine and fowl, um, those antigenic uh, changes will occur over time, and those drift will dictate what the matches are between uh, our, what our immune system recognizes and what the circulating strains are. I, I put on here shifts. I will touch that uh, in a moment. But as, and there's also a natural selection process that goes on as Influenza circulates in various species, in this case shown in, in, in pigs and porcine. Uh, as the mismatches uh, go through the natural uh, uh, infection cycle, in this case pigs, you get a selection of uh, circulating virus that is less recognized by the animal being passed on to, to other um, 
in this case pigs, but those can also have exposure to humans. And that will then allow those uh, strains to uh, infect humans and then uh, dictate what the efficacy of the previous vaccine had been. Now, if we look at drift, which is more dramatic changes in the antigenic makeup of influenza, and again, antigenic shift is where you have either abrupt or major changes in influenza A viruses that results in new hemagglutinin or a combination of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins that will infect humans. The, the biggest example that uh, we all know is in the where there was little or no cross protection when the Spanish flu of 1918 uh, circulated and there was essentially no uh, uh, herd immunity or previous exposure to this uh, strain that caused the major mortality that we saw. But even in the previous shifts that I had on the previous slide, 1957, the Asian flu, and 1968, the Hong Kong flu, 1976, um, with, with the swine flu, which turned out not to be that uh, infective, uh, did not have that much infectivity in humans. And in 2009, when A California emerged, those were also caused by shifts. But again, the amount of the shift will determine what the morbidity and mortality of those circulating strains will be. So that's the background. So flu changes from year to year. And the ability to predict uh, the strains that will be in the upcoming year is, is just that. It's a, it's a prediction, and it's, uh, sometimes they are good, and sometimes we don't quite get there. But dictating how that, um, those vaccines will become a, uh, to market is the production of influenza has typically been done in eggs. Now, this is changing, and I'll have another slide in a minute that uh, egg production is still the pr predominant uh, source for uh, influenza vaccine, but other options are now on the market. And because of the difficulty of this process, um, I'm sure we'll see uh, th these other production capabilities uh, be increased over time. But twice a year, as I mentioned previously, and for the upcoming Northern Hemisphere season in February, and for the upcoming Southern Hemisphere season uh, in September, the strains are picked as to what will uh, be used in the vaccines. The, uh, then those, the HA and NA genes that are identified are then inserted either by reverse genetics or through reassortant technology into backbone genes that are uh, adapted for growth in eggs. Typically, the uh, Puerto Rican 8834 PR8 is the backbone uh, uh, genetic makeup that's used for those strains. Um, and through that process of uh, inserting or reassorting or reverse genetics, those modifications, there are modifications to that strain that's going to go into eggs, or there's also spontaneous mutation that occurs through this whole process of um, inserting HANNA into PR8 and in just the normal uh, progression of the process of inserting the genes as well as going into eggs. The, um, once those, the HA, NA genes and the PRA backbone are formed, those are called, called the candidate vaccine virus, which are then made available from either WHO or, or CDC. And those strains are then given to the, in the commercial sector to those that are making vaccine and uh, used to, to inject into fertilized eggs for several days, and obviously we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of eggs here in production. The allantoic fluid is then collected, purified, inactivated, and then uh, bottled and used for injection. So a pretty onerous uh, process, but it's been um, it's been the standard process now for for a number of a number of years. Driven by both the the a need to adapt. Uh, new strains every year to what will be circulating, as well as to coming up with production techniques that are going to be more efficient. New generation vaccines have either been uh, approved or are on the market or are in various phases of clinical trials or are still in the investigation stage. Now, I just have a couple slides capturing a few of these. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just 
an example of what's going on in the space from early development all the way through to approval for use. Um, the first example here, Medicago is in phase three clinical trials with a, uh, they use a, a VLP, a virus like particle approach, which are empty shells with the hemagglutinin uh, exposed on the surface. Uh, so this is a recombinant protein approach. It also is coupled with a uh, next generation, if you will, uh, production method, and that these uh, VLPs are made in tobacco plants. So higher production, not in eggs, is the advantage, at least, that, that uh, we have from, from uh, this uh, particular approach. Novavax in, has a, an, a hemagglutinin and nanoparticle technology in development. Uh, Protein Sciences, now part of Sanofi Pasteur, has won approval for their uh, influenza vaccine, which is a baclovirus-derived uh, recombinant hemagglutinin that's made in SF9 cells. Uh, that's just a quick little diagram to the right as to how uh, the BLPs are made and then expressed in SF9 cell culture. They are then purified and uh, made into an injectable form um, for, the, uh, for the virus uh, vaccine. Uh, two other examples, uh, Sequeris, which is now approved. Uh, they do use the candidate vaccine virus, the CVV, but they have um, uh, used a cell culture approach where they will use the, uh, the virus that is isolated and then grown in mammalian cells, could be MDCKs rather than in eggs. So this, although it uses the same backbone virus, has a different production method uh, rather than eggs. Uh, Another example is Vaxart, which is, again, an uh, early um, development uh, process. They have something that's quite unique, that they have an oral delivery system. Uh, that's a typo there. It should be TLR, not TRL, excuse me. But they use a toll-length receptor adjuvant together with a non-replicating adenovirus vector to deliver a recombinant uh, hemagglutinin through the gut. So several novel approaches here, a vectored approach, a recombinant hemagglutination approach, and delivery through oral rather than injection. So these are the directions that we're going in the vaccine space to account for the changes that we see in flu, as well as the difficulties in production. Obviously, having to know the detail and the backbone and the genetics of the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase is very helpful and required for these new techniques. And the, uh, this is also true with uh, the, really the next approach, which has been going on for a number of years now, but I think we're seeing a lot more activity, a lot more investment by large pharma as well as by biopharma companies, smaller companies, Janssen, Sanofi, GSK, et cetera, as they're lifted, listed on the right looking for approaches that we don't have to make a new vaccine every season, that we can have more of a universal approach. In the middle is a diagram of the hemagglutinin uh, protein. At the base, you can see in blue the more conserved proteins that are part of the, or uh, epitopes, I should say, that are part of the stalk region of the uh, hemagglutinin, whereas in the head region is the more variable. Um, you see more diversity in epitopes that changes. The, uh, from year to year. So some approaches uh, have used, let's target the stalk or the stem that has a more conserved antigen so we don't have to change from year to year from the variable region we see in the head. Um, so that is obviously one approach to a universal approach. Uh, another is to take a more, um, a higher number of hemagglutin and epitopes and put them into a single vaccine and uh, again, try to get a broader spectrum of uh, coverage. Uh, a VLP-based delivery approach has the ability of using recombinants and to change quickly. And in the bottom example is really from FluGen where they have an M2-deleted virus, so it's replicin replication deficient that can be used, but it also is, has the ability of carrying multiple NA and HA genes at the same time. So, the, uh, those approaches still in development, not into the, the phase three clinical trial space, although uh, a couple companies are getting very close. 
will hopefully allow us to have a more efficient production as well as a broader coverage. Uh, in the last slide, just to segue over into to Patrick's part of this presentation, in order to know what is uh, the strains that are out there and to get the base, baseline activity, a lot of the strains that we collect come through vaccine efficacy studies. Now, granted, a lot of in public health, and I'm not dealing with the public health side of things here where these uh, next-gen sequencing has already been, uh, been used extensively, but it's through the trials that we're seeing, what are the breakthrough strains that we're seeing that are not covered by the vaccines that are in trials? Um, is really where we're getting our material to, to investigate circulating strains. And just real quickly, uh, in efficacy studies, we do a molecular detection of uh, an ILI illness. If it's uh, influenza that we detect, it then goes to a viral confirmation so that isolates are obtained. Those isolates are then uh, expanded so that you have a higher titer that can be used for several different things, including um, uh, ferret serum immuno, uh, uh, serotyping, looking at strains. But then that, those isolates are also used then for the genetic or for the Sanger sequencing or next-gen sequencing to look at both the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase and also potentially the entire genome. So the, um, getting these isolates is integral to, to what uh, we have available to investigate circulating strains. And it's with that material that uh, Patrick and his team have uh, moved into the next generation sequencing space to look at uh, strain typing and, and other uh, data that can be acquired from, from the genetic side of, of uh, the isolated strains. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to um, go to the next section. I thank you very much, Wayne. So um, uh, that was a great perspective, and I think tees up uh, the uh, remainder of the discussion very well. So I, I'm going to talk some about the genetic characterization of influenza. I'll begin by uh, providing a little bit of perspective on, on uh, how the genome of influenza was characterized, um, what its structure looks like, um, different methods that we can use for molecular detection uh, before talking about sequencing uh, in particular and in a little bit more depth. So to begin, uh, let's talk a little bit about the characterization of the influenza genome. And I think as Wayne uh, very aptly uh, um, summarized, um, by characterizing the genome, this really helps us to, or it enables us to surveil uh, influenza at the molecular level. Uh, it's very important to recognize that influenza constantly evolves. In fact, it's, it's uh, the evolution or the changes in the sequence of influenza are not only important from a public health perspective, but from the uh, perspective of the virus, this is essentially one of its escape strategies. It's how it um, uh, is able to propagate itself so effectively because it essentially provides an escape mechanism uh, as it encounters uh, immunity and immune systems uh, out in the wild. So if we want to understand how that virus uh, evolves, one of the best ways to do do so is through genome characterization. This gives us uh, insight, of course, into the efficacy of vaccines and therapeutics. Um, we can see whether or not um, the targeting was effective. It supports epidemiological studies, of course, and I think most importantly, it informs the development of future vaccines and therapeutics. Um, in 2004, through funding uh, uh, at the uh, National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, the Influenza Genome Sequencing Project uh, was started. Uh, the, most of the work uh, initially was done by the Institute for Genomic Research, now the J. Craig uh, Venter uh, Institute. And as you can see in the diagram that I have in the upper right hand of this slide, uh, which unfortunately is a, uh, maybe a little small, but um, the, the important um, uh, parts of the graph are the black line is basically all of the different uh, flu sequences uh, that have accumulated uh, over time, and, and you can see that uh, it's, it's a very large number, uh, over 20,000 um, uh, were developed through that influenza uh, genome project. Uh, interestingly, um, if we go back about 13 years, 2005 was when uh, one of their first publications came out. 
Um, that was 209 genomes. This was all done by Sanger sequencing. Um, it was almost exclusively uh, H3N2 strains, um, but um, uh, they also had a couple of other strains as well. Now, uh, here we are later um, with um, well over 20,000 sequences from that project alone. Uh, and, and I think very importantly, the global initiative on sharing all influenza data, or a G, uh, um, Guy said, it was launched in 2008. The idea was to uh, promote sharing of not only the sequence data, but of clinical and epidemiological data as well. Uh, geographical, species-specific, avian, animal virus data, basically uh, a way to um, coordinate sharing of all of the information that by, my, will be relevant to um, uh, uh, various interventions, including vaccine development that are important in controlling influenza. Uh, at this point in time, there are over 40,000 isolates uh, within the database that they maintain. So. Let's talk just briefly about the structure of influenza and specifically its genome. Uh, the depiction that you see here is taken from a, a publication from Tao and Zhang in uh, Science. It was a little perspectives article. To me, as a molecular biologist, one of the most interesting parts about influenza is uh, the way that its genome is structured. So its genome is very compact. It's a little over 13 kilobases, uh, but it's comprised of eight RNA segments that you can almost think of as protochromosomes in a way. The smallest are uh, maybe as small as 800 nucleotides, the largest about 2,500 nucleotides. They're packaged in a certain way, so essentially they're packaged into these ribonucleoprotein complexes. It contains the RNA segment itself, um, a nucleoprotein, which is encoded by the viral genome, and as well as the polymerase complex, which is also um, uh, encoded by the viral genome. Now, of course, uh, the HA genes and the NA genes uh, corresponding to hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are uh, in uh, are the proteins that we typically think of because um, the variations in those proteins determine subtype, um, and other variations within uh, those proteins can also determine the strain, and that's why we focus so much on the NA and HA genes. And so when we think about the genome in the context of vaccine development, we rely upon targeting viruses that through uh, surveillance are forecasted to be in circulation during the flu season. And so those global surveillance programs, what they can determine in terms of the sequence and uh, the, the uh, serology of these viruses is very important. And, and tracking how influenza changes from uh, during surveillance and in response to a uh, challenge by vaccines or um, uh, antivirals is also very important. So if we think about molecular detection methods, and here I'm going to um, uh, put aside for the moment uh, different uh, immunological-based methods and really only focus on genetic-based methods, there are, of course, PCR-based methods, um, uh, specifically RT-PCR. They're sensitive. They're specific. The fragments that are obtained from it can be sequenced. However, it has very poor quantitation. It's rather low per throughput, and it can be very time-consuming. There are also multiplex PCR methods where you can essentially mix a lot of primers together. However, there is risk of nonspecific amplification uh, due to that uh, multiplexing. Uh, TACMAN can take, take care of that. It is much better at quantitation, but now you don't have a product at the end that uh, is, is readily sequenced. Uh, there's also some microarray-based methods um, that um, unfortunately require rather expensive and complex equipment. Uh, and then there are pyrosequencing methods that can be very sensitive. However, you get very limited sequencing information upon this. And I think most importantly, all of these methods rely upon existing sequence information so that we can target known variants of high interest that can distinguish between um, different types. Thus, uh, these methods are limited by our current knowledge. So, if we now turn to sequencing-based methods, such as Sanger sequencing, which is illustrated here on the left-hand uh, side, um, essentially you're taking the viral genome, all eight segments, you're reverse transcribing them to create cDNA. You then take um, gene-specific primers to amplify specific sequences that are overlapping within the viral genome so that you have a series of amplification products that you can then sequence broad, uh, bidirectionally. Now, importantly, uh, Sanger sequencing technology is very broadly available. The technology is very well understood. 
However, there are several downsides to this. One is that the, there's, as you can see from this diagram, there's a lot of PCR and, and primer management going on. And so, for example, if you look at the NS um, segment, it's very small. You can make a single PCR product that's less than 1,000 bases. But for something like the PV2 segment, you have a, you know, a 2.3 to 2.5 kilobase segment. And uh, as a result, you actually have to break this up into several smaller sequences that are then easier to sequence using Sanger technology. Also importantly, um, with Sanger technology, it's important to remember that every sequence that you see is actually an ensemble of sequences. By that I mean you actually have many, many molecules corresponding to each of these amplification products. You sequence each individually, but the readout that you see on the sequencer is actually an amalgamation or an ensemble of all of those individual sequences. Um, so if there are, for example, if the isolate is not pure, if you have uh, more than one strain uh, in that uh, isolate, depending upon the, uh, you may not be able to detect that because of that ensemble sequence. And then finally, there's also the possibility of false negatives because if the primers that you have to use here don't land correctly uh, on your sequences, uh, they will fail to amplify. So with all of that in mind, um, uh, the field has moved towards next generation sequencing approaches. And so, for example, um, uh, within the next generation sequencing approach that, that we decided to take, it's a single tube reaction. We're taking advantage of the conserved sequences on the five prime and three prime ends of each viral RNA. So for influenza A, there's a common sequence on the five prime and three prime end of each uh, sequence. For influenza B, there's actually some sequence differences between each of the different viral RNA segments. However, um, it's uh, essentially invariant uh, between uh, strains uh, and subtypes. And so we can use that information to go in and target each of those molecules. Now, as a result, we end up creating rather large PCR products, but taking advantage of a next generation sequencing library preparation method called Nextera Tagmentation. We create a shotgun sequencing library from all of those fragments uh, simultaneously. At the same time, we're also uh, incorporating a sample barcode so that we can take the sequence information and disambiguate it and assign it to uh, different samples. So in essence, those individual fragments, remember I told you for Sanger sequencing, we essentially have an ensemble sequence at the readout level. Here, individual fragments are clonally amplified as clusters on the sequencing flow cell, we sequence them bidirectionally, and because they have that sample barcode, we can now assign it to a sample, and we can think of that as an individual molecule. So if we have multiple species or multiple uh, strains within one isolate that we're working with, we can actually detect that at, at, uh, at good sensitivity. Uh, so in our method, which um, I will uh, illustrate on the next slide from a workflow standpoint, this, by the way, uh, the, these methods were based upon some published methods uh, from Zhao et al. that were published in the Journal of Virology and the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, uh, to give credit where credit is due. We can break this into three components. There's targeting and amplification, where we start with purified viral RNA. We do RT-PCR and amplification to create those segments. We QC this, of course, so that we end up with amplified viral segments. The next step, then, is library pre preparation, where we do tagmentation, barcoding, amplification. We clean up those product, products and quantify them and do final QC before taking them to the next step, which is sequencing anal and analysis. So essentially, we do sequencing. Uh, we then built a custom bioinformatics pipeline that I will tell you a little bit more about. Um, and then we use that sequence information to assemble those viral sequences from all of the different, or those viral segments from all of the different um, um, uh, from all of the different um, uh, sequence reads that we get, and that allows us to do strain identification. So let me go into a little more detail here. Uh, the panel that you see in the upper left is basically um, one of the QC steps uh, after we've done the amplification. So we extract the viral RNA, we use the primers, then you can see here the amplification products. Uh, and we produce amplification products of the appropriate size. These are corresponding to the various, uh, all eight of the uh, viral segments. 
And as you can see from this slide, we've actually taken an isolate. We've performed serial dilutions over a number of logs, and you can see that the amplification products are reproducible across many uh, dilutions of that starting material. The next phase after we've QC'd those products is the uh, transposome-mediated uh, um, library preparation, uh, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with this process is illustrated in the bottom right-hand corner. So essentially we have transposome molecules. This is technology that was uh, originally developed by um, uh, Epicenter Technologies and later acquired by Illumina. Those transposome molecules are complexed with partial adapters. We mix them with the DNA template. Uh, the diagram says genomic DNA, but in this case it's cDNA uh, from uh, the viral RNA segments. Um, then the, they insert into that molecule um, at, at, at mostly random locations. It's, there's a little bit of non-randomness there, but not enough to skew the results for this particular assay. And then we have now amplification ready fragments that are amplified with primers that then reconstitute the full adapter and add a sample barcode so they're now ready for sequencing. So at this point, uh, we've obtained the sequence and then we take it into the bioinformatics analysis, which I think is really in many ways the most interesting part of this assay. Um, so um, our initial focus here is going to be on subtyping and strain identification. So that's what I'm going to talk about. But later in the presentation, I'll also present uh, some possibilities that we're working through now. So the basic bioinformatics pipeline here consists of FASTQ processing, CONTIG assembly, um, then we essentially do a certain level of matching of those CONTIGs uh, against existing data, uh, and then we have a scoring matrix that we use to determine uh, what the type and what the strain is. Um, so once we assemble that CONTIG, we're essentially making or remaking from that sequence data each of the different uh, eight segments. We then take those uh, contiguous or CONTIG sequences, assembled sequences, match them against uh, a custom database that we made, which is substantially the GSED database, but contains other uh, sequence information as well. Then uh, um, subject that to our scoring matrix, which is basically um, uh, according to uh, the length of the match and the number of mismatches. And then we aggregate a weighted score. And then we essentially select the top scoring strains and do another round of matching where we do pairwise competitive alignment. That weighted alignment score is then used to do the final determination. So conceptually, because we have sequences for 40,000 different strains, conceptually we can actually take those different strains uh, and type anything uh, so long as the sequence information is sufficiently um, uh, different between the strains. We have explicitly validated through um, uh, experimentation a number of different strains that are of high interest to some of our uh, vaccine development partners. Uh, and we have others in process now. And uh, you know, certainly as our um, vaccine development partners have more requests, we will um, uh, explicitly uh, validate those as well. Um, so far during our validation, we have obtained 100% accuracy for all of the validated strains that you see here, meaning that um, these uh, were already known to be certain strains. Uh, we took that information, ran our assay, and were able to demonstrate um, uh, in, uh, uh, through replication that we were able to obtain the correct result every time. Now, as you can imagine, if we have uh, any sequence that matches a strain, uh, as long as there's sufficient fidelity, we should be able to identify it. But there are strains that, ha that are more difficult than others because uh, the sequence information um, between two strains may not be sufficiently diverse uh, to allow us to disambiguate between those two strains. So overall, the advantages of the, of the NGS approach, now uh, r recall that I mentioned that we use common sequences on the three and five prime ends of the uh, viral seg RNA segments. So we're actually amplifying the entire genome. We're sequencing the entire genome. When we look to uh, do strain identification, we're, we're focusing on the HA and NA genes. And um, uh, however, we are, as Wayne mentioned, sequencing substantially the entire influenza genome. So we get the full sequence of the HA and NA genes. We have a reduced chance of false negatives because um, we know that those terminal sequences are very, very conserved. 
we have a very streamlined workflow. Instead of a large number of amplicons that we have to manage, we now do a single tube amplification by strain. Any nonspecific amplification that may occur as part of that, we can actually filter out bioinformatically. So this is a very high throughput method because of this tremendous um, uh, amount of capacity that we have on sequencing platforms. And as I mentioned, although we're focusing on HA and NA genes for obvious reasons, we're able to characterize the viral genome uh, um, uh, beyond just those HA and NA genes. So this gives us the potential um, uh, to identify and characterize new strains and to monitor uh, and gain detailed insight into strain evolution outside of the NA and HA genes. So here's a vaccine development use case. So uh, we'll use NGS to inform the efficacy of that virus or of that vaccine, for instance. So you develop a vaccine using specific strains. Then you have a patient that develops flu systems so, or symptoms, so you collect a sample. You perform uh, strain identification using NGS, and now if you if you can see that the strain and the sequence that was uh, that's in that patient is actually identical to what you used to develop that vaccine, then well that kind of points to poor efficacy of that vaccine. On the other hand, if you see something different, this tells you several things. It might uh, point you to breakthrough strains um, that are um, uh, or potentially escape mechanisms that the uh, that the virus is using and essentially it, it uh, uh, you had the correct strain to begin with but through mutation uh, uh, the vaccine has now found a way to avoid um, uh, challenge from the vaccine and uh, so that can inform future vaccine strategies so this idea that you can characterize at a genetic level um, a constantly evolving sequence, and then uh, in the face of either natural evolution or evolution and selection according to various challenges, um, including vaccines, uh, hopefully you can see very clear parallels uh, with how we might also think about analyzing um, efficacy and development of antivirals. And I think importantly, you can also see um, uh, parallels to um, uh, um, oncology, which is the focus of much of our work. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, provide a brief summary. So, of course, uh, typing is enabled by serological tests, um, as well as genotyping of discrete regions of the viral genome. However, strain identification requires really nice detail that we can make possible through sequence analysis. NGS, or next generation sequencing, in contrast to Sanger sequencing, gives us a really streamlined, high throughput approach to strain identification, as well as broader genomic characterization of influenza. So viral evolution in the wild or in response to vaccine or antiviral challenges, we can use that information in the sequence to inform future development of vaccines and therapeutics. And I'd like to take just a moment to provide credit to the appropriate folks here, uh, Pauline Cronin and Makun Patel, assay development scientists on my team uh, did most of the molecular biology that you see here. Uh, Gunjan Haryani, Martin Bukovic, and Jason Powers, uh, very talented bioinformatics scientists also in my team, uh, uh, developed the pipeline that we're using. Uh, Maria Curtis, who's a program manager in my team, uh, um, uh, uh, project managed all of this work. And then finally, uh, Brent Seaton and Wayne Hogarfy uh, at, our, at our vaccines uh, unit uh, provided, uh, we're all molecular biologists and, and bioinformatics scientists, and, and Brent and Wayne were able to provide us with that biological information so necessary to make these um, uh, types of assays relevant. And with that, I want to uh, provide, uh, or I want to pass it back to Wayne uh, for one additional slide that, uh, to provide perspective on what we've talked about today. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, just to wrap this up, a couple high-level thoughts. You know, the next generation sequencing where strain identification has been out there for a while now in the public health sector and, you know, CDC, the state health departments, New York State have adopted these methods. Um, and getting it into more of a commercial vaccine space is, is the next step. And that's what we've been trying to do. The, um, but we also have to look at, I think, some lessons learned or some activities that, going, that go on, for example, in the immuno-oncology space that Patrick's more familiar with than I am. Um, that maybe we can look through more than just strain identification. Um, yes, it's a, it's a way to get more detailed information, as, as Patrick has pointed out, um, 
Uh, we can get input now from the genetic level that can be used for vaccine design, which has been going on for a while. Some in silico uh, development has been, been out there for a while, but now as you get more extended NGS data, we can expand on that capability. Um, and maybe we can also look at this at, at even pro profiling as we do in the immuno-oncology space of uh, immune or vaccine design triggered with or coupled with what are immune response triggers that would be more helpful. Um, I'm sure there's you know, uh, research going on in that area, um, but I think this helps us bring the more data, the more strains that we can identify this with, the better opportunity we have to, to um, look at that potential for profiling immune response. And we haven't really uh, touched on the therapeutic side, which is pretty interesting. The serologic strain typing obviously doesn't help you when you're looking at therapeutics. And so uh, if we continue on the antiviral therapeutics range, obviously identifying mutations and whatnot have been integral for years now uh, at therapeutics. And hopefully as we expand now to the entire genome, we could find other um, mutations or other changes that will impact therapeutics. And again, as I mentioned, for uh, immuno-oncology and for vaccines, uh, perhaps um, molecular profiling of these strains would be uh, potentially helpful on therapeutic design. So with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it back, back over to uh, Lisa uh, for, for questions that have come up. So thank you all. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you both for your very informative presentations. I just want to remind the audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your presentation window. So we're going to get started. We have a few minutes for Q&A, so let's dive right in. Um, so the first question, and I'm just going to ask the question, and then um, Wayne or Pat, you know, just feel free to jump in, but is next generation sequencing standardized across laboratories or industry? In other words, are the details that Pat described common across providers of next generation sequencing, or does each provider do it a different way? Uh, this is Pat. I'll take that one. So um, uh, the, the short answer is no. Um, uh, certainly there are initiatives underway to standardize various facets of next generation sequencing, uh, either in specific indication areas or um, more globally at certain technology levels. And, and we, wherever possible, are taking part in some of those initiatives and even leading some of them. That being said, um, uh, the, for influenza in particular, no, I wouldn't say that it's, it's standardized at all. I think um, there's certainly a lot of convergence around the molecular biology. Um, the Zhao et al. papers that I um, uh, pointed to I think are great examples of, of how to um, amplify the viral genome in a way that's uh, relatively unbiased and allows us uh, to do this sequencing. Uh, I think the most heterogeneity is probably present in the bioinformatics pipelines. Um, so um, uh, we'll, we'll see where this goes, but uh, yes, it's, it would be um, premature to say that any of this has been standardized in any way. Thank you, Pat. And our next question. Identification of circulating strains is currently predicated on identifying HAI antibodies in the community to specific flu strains to gauge prevalence. This does not work for H3N2 strains from the 2011 to 2015 timeframe as is demonstrated by the vaccine mismatch data. So the MNT testing is important, allied to NGS to give prognostic data for seasonal vaccines. Have NGS results been more predictive of VE than HAI? I'll start this, and I'll let Patrick end it. <laughs> um, I, it's a great question, and I, um, I don't know if uh, NGS has been more predictive for vaccine e efficacy than HAI. I think just a side comment, w you know, with the changes in H3N2 over the last several years and the lack of uh, ability to hemagglutinate uh, has caused problems, but a lot of that data has been looking at strain drift and um, uh, the, the more public health look at what are these strains doing, so it's difficult to type them. 
because of that la lower ability to agglutinate. Um, we haven't seen it as much in looking at immunogenicity and reactivity because it depends on the strain you're using, for instance, to do, to do HAI. But that really digresses a little bit from, from um, uh, the actual question. I don't know if NGS has been more predictive for efficacy or not. It would be a great, probably someone in the public health sector that's on this uh, webinar probably knows that answer better than I do. I don't, Patrick, have you seen? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have the answer to that myself. I mean, uh, editorially, I can say that, you know, if, if we're thinking about immunogenicity, it, you know, it's all about uh, modifications to the epitope that's recognized by um, uh, um, uh, uh, various antibodies. And, and if we're thinking about uh, genomics, we can see variants uh, uh, in, uh, and here I'm speaking more generally as opposed to about influenza in particular. Uh, with, with genomic approaches, we can see the emergence of variants um, that may be silent. Um, they may not lead to amino acid changes or they may be hidden, meaning that they are in portions of the genome that are uh, not required uh, for um, uh, various immunological approaches. In other words, they don't really change the epitopes. So I, I do think that with genomics, you can get a, an increasingly granular picture of viral evolution. But um, understanding whether that uh, what you see in the genomics is predictive is is a question uh, that I'm not sure of the answer of. And, and I think even more importantly, you, you can see uh, certain kinds of changes, but understanding whether those changes are impactful or not, I think, is, is still kind of an open question. Thank you, Donalyn, for your insights on that. Um, our next question is, does the suspected mixing vessel, pig or birds, seem to have effects on shift? Uh, well, yeah, this is Wayne. It, well, luckily, the shifts don't occur very often. Uh, we don't see them, you know, unlike drift, which happens continuously. Uh, the shifts don't, and again, this is an area I'm not well versed in, but uh, one of the difficulties of looking at SHIP is looking at that in a real-time perspective to prove is this SHIP, did it actually occur because of the mixing vessel? Um, the mixing vessel does occur. I think they're linked. Um, but do they um, – uh, I think the, the um, shift based on mixing vessel is probably true. How often – are the shifts that we see due to the mixing vessel? That's a good question. Thank you, Wayne. And another question. This year's strains were based on data from China or the Southern Hemisphere? Uh, strain selection for Northern Hemisphere is always based, it's a continuum from the Southern Hemisphere, especially Australia, and Asia uh, as part of the equation as though it goes into uh, deciding on strains for the upcoming season. So um, I'm not part of that strain selection process that uh, consortium, WHO, and other, you know, uh, national public health groups and public health groups are part of, but um, it's typically made from both Asia and the Southern Hemisphere, especially Australia. Thank you. And we have time for a couple more, I think. Um, the next question is, do you envision NGS replacing ferret serum hemagglutination inhibition to assess or strain type circulating strains of influenza? Do you want that one, Patrick, or what do you want me to start? Yeah, um, I, I, yeah I'll take that one on. I, um, I don't think so in in the near term. I mean, NGS is still uh, relatively complex. So you can get a great deal of detailed uh, information, but um, uh, you know, um, uh, serology methods are are very rapid and and immediately actionable. So I I do think that um, the uh, the NGS methods, while extremely uh, informative, 
may not be in all cases or all intended uses as as timely as some of the other methods that are out there. Um, and, you know, they're also not necessarily um, uh, usable uh, sort of out in the field, uh, as it were. Certainly we can collect and, and then, you know, ship and, and do all of these analyses. But there are so many different use cases um, that need to be satisfied that I don't see NGS replacing uh, that method. I do see it augmenting that method. Yeah, and I think you pointed out already that, you know, the genetic makeup doesn't necessarily impact what you're seeing from an immunologic perspective. So it's still going to be, I think it's going to be both, and the cases are going to have to be built where the NGS data has to be matched up to what you see uh, on a functional perspective. Thank you both for your insights again on that question. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participating in today's event. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Q Squared Solutions, for making today's educational webcast possible. You will receive an email from Apply Clinical Trials alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And we will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.